Good evening. Welcome to our June event with Dr. Mark Vernon. The title of tonight's talk is Jesus the Imagination, Taking William Blake's Christianity Seriously. Before we start, the usual bit of housekeeping. While Mark is talking, you won't be able to switch on your cameras or microphones. If you have questions or comments, you can either save them for the end of the talk and ask Mark directly, or you can put them in the chat as and when they occur. We will keep an eye on the chat while Mark is talking. Mark, can you please join me? Hi there, Sabili. hope you can see me now. Yes, thank you very much. So we're side by side. Thank you, Ian, who's working in the background. Um, you will remember, Mark, from the last issue of Bala, the issue on um, war and peace, which we published in November um, last year. I remember reading Mark's piece shortly after he submitted it um, to us. And almost immediately, I remember I thought I must get in touch and ask him if he would do a talk for us, because there was so much more that I wanted to know. And he said yes. And so I'm very pleased now to formally introduce him to you. Mark Vernon is a psychotherapist, blogger and writer, producing journalistic articles as well as books. He has a PhD in ancient Greek philosophy and degrees in theology and physics. His books include A Secret History of Christianity, Jesus, the Last Inkling and the Evolution of Consciousness, published in 2019, and Dante's Divine Comedy, a Guide for the Spiritual Journey, published in 2021. Mark used to be a priest in the Church of England and now lives amidst the lovely hills of Humberwell in South London. Mark will speak for about 45 minutes and you will then be able to ask him questions with camera on or camera off. Mark, thank you. Over to you. Look, thank you very much indeed for that lovely welcome and it's a great joy to speak to you under the auspices of the Blake Society, um, from which I have gained so much in my own engagement with Blake. So that's wonderful to do. Let me get my slides up. So... Okay. So I'm hoping now you can see the famous portrait that's in the National Portrait Gallery of William Blake to get us going. Taking Blake's Christianity seriously, it's a slightly strange thing to say in a way because at one level Blake is clearly Christian, it's even quite trivial to say so, but I guess the question is what sort of Christian and why might that matter to us now 200 years on? And I hope to make the case that it does matter to us and moreover his kind of Christianity might actually be appealing now given all that's happened particularly religiously in the last 200 years. So let me plunge straight in and start to unpack this form of Christianity that I think Blake pretty clearly puts on display. Here is the last plate from one of his earliest publications, There Is No Natural Religion. And I wanted to put this on because right from the earliest days of Blake's sort of public voice, his public life, right through to the end, there is a theme, a consistent kind of Christianity that you can see running through, although I think he does very much develop it through the ups and downs of his own life. And this small booklet, There Is No Natural Religion, comes almost at the beginning of when he started producing his own work. And this sentence is really key. It's very, very telling. Therefore, God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is. And the reference is, of course, to the incarnation, the central Christian insight that this person, historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was also the divine presence amongst us, Christ incarnate. But the way that Blake expresses that is deeply informed, in fact, 
And it's connected to a tradition that runs right through from the earliest days of Christianity, when the great fathers of the church, as Christianity was unpacking in the first four or five centuries, said something very similar indeed. So, for example, Clement of Alexandria in the second century said that the word of God became a man so that from a man you might learn how to become a god. And then in the third century, Cyril of Alexandria said, by dwelling in one, the world dwelt in all. And in the fourth century, Athanasius of Alexandria said, the son of God became man so that we might become God. And then in the fifth, just to make the point, Leo the Great said, the descent of God to the human level was at the same time the ascent of man to the divine level. Now, this chiming with early forms of Christianity is doubly interesting because it particularly, I think, draws a link between Blake's Christianity and the Christianity of the Eastern tradition within Christendom, that of orthodoxy. That, I say that because since the Reformation particularly, of course, Blake lives a couple of hundred years after the Reformation, so very much in the aftermath of that shock across Western Europe. Since the Reformation, the theology of these early church figures has been pretty much sidelined. And what happens is instead of emphasizing the transfiguration and resurrection side of the incarnation, therefore God becomes as we are, that we might become as he is, the crucifixion and the separation of humanity from God came to be emphasized. And so the reformers on the whole tended to focus on a kind of salvation that emphasized an infinite abyss that had opened up between humanity and God. And that was what salvation was about. Moreover, there's even a little detail here that's worth noting. It's always worth noting in Blake's lines that although they can feel slightly strange and confusing to us, I think pretty much always every even tense is crucial. And here that's certainly so, because Blake says God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is. This is not something that happened in the past, as it were, 1800 years ago for Blake, 2000 years ago for us. This is the incarnation as an ongoing eternal act that's happening even now. And this is something that's stressed much more again in orthodoxy and, and in fact in mystical forms of Christianity in the West too, where this notion of deification can be found. And we know that Blake very much engaged with mystical writers such as Teresa of Avila. So he's emphasizing that in using this present tense, God becoming, God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is. He's situating himself in a very particular part of the Christian tradition. Certainly very different from the deism of his times, which was really the beginnings of the separation of a felt sense of an active, omnipresent participation in the divine life that then in the 19th century and into our 20th and 21st century became atheism itself, as it were, God moved to the boundaries of human perception and then was able to fall away from very many people's perception anyway. And so the human form divine, as Blake famously puts it, could seem to become irrelevant, making way for people now to be able to read Blake, almost marginalizing his Christianity or treating it as a kind of cultural optional extra that's not really crucial to his core message. But I think that it is. Now, tangible evidence for this link with orthodoxy um, is coming actually in a forthcoming book um, published by Paul Grave Macmillan. I think it's going to be called Blake and Jesus. And in particular, one of the contributors is a great teacher of mine on Blake, Suzanne Sklar. And she, in her contribution to that book, presents tangible evidence that Blake was exposed to Eastern orthodoxy in London at the time. One of the links comes um, because the Moravians, of which his mother was a part, they took their route into the Christian tradition via orthodoxy rather than via the Protestant traditions or Catholicism. And that is uh, sort of documented um, as well. Um, so that's one way in which Blake might have known about orthodoxy. Um, but also um, Suzanne charts how throughout his life in London, he would have lived within just a few minutes walking distance of orthodox chapels 
that had opened up and indeed were actively engaging with the philosophers and thinkers of the time. And that seems very likely then that Blake would have seen icons in these Orthodox chapels and hence showing this picture of the Virgin and Child by Blake, which of course looks very icon-like. If you know what an icon of the Virgin and Child looks like in the Orthodox tradition, you can immediately see resonance with Blake's rendition of it here. And moreover, of course, icons are known in this tradition as windows on eternity, and particularly in the latter part of Christian of Blake's understanding of Christianity, this notion of eternity becomes absolutely fundamental. Um, we'll have more to say about that. For now, just to um, sort of honor the title of my talk, Jesus, the Imagination, um, not actually a phrase that Blake directly uses, but the links often made in work on his Christianity. Jesus is the imagination because of the incarnation. That is making explicit in history what's eternally true and perceivable through the imagination, that the substantial world around us is also entirely spiritual, that Jesus as a human person was also a divine body, as we indeed are members of the divine body, as Blake puts it, a notion which he would have found from the writings of St Paul, as well as no doubt perceiving it himself. Jesus the human imagination, therefore, is perfectly coincident with the divine vision, vision being another hugely important Blakeian word, of course, but the human imagination, when discerned, when free, when aligned, knows of the divine vision as well. And that's a notion that's implicit in the Christian affirmation that the incarnation in Jesus is as one who's both fully God and fully human, to which we as well can aspire. Jesus, you might also say then, with this link of the human and the divine, is a full instantiation of one of the great themes of Blake's works, which is the contraries, the contraries of innocence and experience, of course, but also the finite and the infinite, the mortal and the eternal, death and life even. Another really important part of Blake's understanding of Christianity, which we'll return to. So that's to say something about Blake's early account of Christianity, particularly focusing, I think, on the incarnation and this understanding that therefore God becomes as we are so that we might be as he is. But I want to turn now to the latter part of Blake's work. Um, this is plate four when the great epic poem Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion begins, probably written um, uh, in you know, the 1810s, the 1820s towards the, towards this second, certainly well into the second half of Blake's life. He printed it probably in about 1819. And there you can see similar themes developed in this later work. You can call it, I think, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, his kind of mature account of Christianity, but the same account is there. So just note some of the famous texts. I'll read a little bit from the middle section of this plate four when Blake writes, awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows, wake, expand. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine. I'm not a God afar off, I'm a brother and friend. Within your bosoms I reside and you reside in me. This powerful sense that the transcendent is actually known imminently, that the two are coincident when we follow this golden string which he so much promises to offer us in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. There's also really important details to notice again, a bit like the becomes in the present tense, and I hope you can just about see in this reproduction of the plate the detail at the top, which is a bit of Greek, and it reads uh, monos hoiesos, um, which means alone with Jesus. And this is a quote from the Bible that occurs in two places, one in the Synoptic Gospel, so that's Mark, Matthew and Luke, and then once also in John's Gospel. And in the Synoptics, it occurs in the story of the Transfiguration. And in the Transfiguration, the story that Peter, James and John go up the mountain with Jesus and he's transfigured before them. And then after Elijah and Moses have disappeared, they're left alone with Jesus. And so it's a nod to how when we understand the presence of Jesus and this notion of becoming so that we might become as God, 
what you know is material life, embodied life, this life, through this divine imagination, as it truly is, which is radiating the divine. This is the story of the transfiguration, a kind of glimpse of eternity known in this life. So Monos Jesus is a reference partly to the transfiguration, giving you a sense of Blake's understanding of these things. But then there's also in John's gospel, this phrase Monos Jesus as well. And this is, comes in a different story. It's the story which only appears in John's gospel of the woman caught in adultery. Here's one of the images that Blake presented of a biblical story to Thomas Butts. And it's of this story. It tells a particular moment in the story, which Blake clearly does to emphasize a point. You'll know that she's brought before Jesus with her accusers. And then Jesus writes in the sand and then makes this famous utterance the one without sin can cast the first stone. And at that point, her accusers turn and move away, realizing that their trick on Jesus has tricked them. And there's this incredibly poignant moment where Jesus is left with the woman. And Blake has painted this so as to emphasize the moment where the woman herself, you might say, is still in between life and death. Jesus is writing in the sand. He, of course, at least in the mythology, is the one without sin, and so could still yet cast the first stone. She doesn't yet know her fate. She's caught in this contrary. But of course, Jesus himself is caught in this contrary too, in between life and death. His accusers are out to get him. And in John's gospel, he's very clear that he knows that his fate lies on the cross. And so actually, this is an identification between Jesus and the woman caught in adultery that Blake is painting here. She is seeing in the encounter with Jesus and Jesus is showing her. Some have even said even by Jesus painted um, by Blake as bowing towards her as knowing the human form divine in her, too, as well as in Jesus. God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is through the eyes of the imagination. A tremendous moment that Blake is emphasizing and then linking back with this phrase monos hoiesus the centrality of these things for him. Back to Jerusalem and plate four. Jesus, you might say, pervades throughout the whole poem. Um, throughout, there's this spirit of the continual forgiveness of sins, as Blake puts it, that keeps returning like a kind of pulse through all the shenanigans and the ups and downs of loss and his spectre of Vala and Jerusalem and so on, of Albion and falling and despairing once again. Um, but he's also present in the sense of the Saviour's kingdom, as Blake calls it, or the divine body is present, but also in particular moments as well. And the divine Saviour appears several times throughout the poem at certain low mo moments, often Albion's low moments, um, but also at Jerusalem's low moments as well. Jerusalem is the divine aspect, you might say, of Albion, the hero, really, of the poem, hence Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. And she constantly tries to revive Albion's spirit, to revive his eternal perception, and repeatedly fails to do so, and so enters into the kind of fallen state herself, which, of course, is what Jesus does at the moment of the incarnation. But there's a section when Jesus, the divine saviour, talks with Jerusalem. And I wanted to emphasize that now. Um, Jesus, in this other image, not from the great poem, of course, but one of the um, illustrations to the night thoughts, um, emphasizing the wounds of Jesus, and so entering into eternal death. Jesus comforts Jerusalem in Jerusalem, the nation of John Albion, and says, these things when Jerusalem starts to despair. Here's the section. Um, but Jerusalem faintly saw him closed in the dungeons of Babylon. Her form was held by Beulah's daughters, but all within unseen. She sat at the mills, her hair unbound, her feet naked, cut with the flints, her tears run down, her reason grows like the wheel of hand, incessant turning day and night without rest. Insane, she raves upon the wind's horse, inarticulate. All night, Vala hears, she triumphs in pride of holiness. 
to see Jerusalem deface her lineaments with bitter blows of despair, while the satanic holiness triumphed in Vala, in a religion of chastity and uncircumcised selfishness, both of the head and heart and loins, clothed up in moral pride. But the divine lamb stood beside Jerusalem. Off she saw the lineaments divine, and off the voice heard, and oft she said, O Lord and Saviour, have the gods of the heathen pierced thee? Or hast thou been pierced in the house of thy friends? Art thou alive, or livest thou for evermore? Or art thou not, but a delusive shadow, a thought that liveth not? Babel mocks, saying, There is no God, nor Son of God, that thou, O human imagination, O divine body, art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and this iron mill. The stars of Albion cruel rise, thou biddest to sweet influences, for thou also sufferest with me, although I behold thee not. And although I sin and blaspheme thy holy name, thou pitiest me, because thou knowest I am deluded by the turning mills and by these visions of pity and love because of Albion's death. Thus spake Jerusalem, and thus the divine voice replied, mild shade of man, pitiest thou these visions of terror and woe? Give forth thy pity and love, fear not, lo, I am with thee always, only believe in me that I have power to raise from death. And the power to raise from death is shown towards the end of the poem when Albion finally awakens, first of all, resurrected by the divine breath, or spirit, and this is the vivified Britannia. And Britannia is the reunion of Jerusalem and Vala, who've become so horribly divided through the poem. And Britannia breathes in the spirit upon Albion's breast and he starts to stir. This is how Blake describes it. This is an image from slightly earlier in the poem, which is Jerusalem herself awakening. And then subsequently the spirit breathes in this way as Blake describes it. Her voice pierced Albion's clay cold ear. He moved upon the rock. The divine breath went forth upon the morning hills. Albion moved upon the rock. He opened his eyelids in pain. In pain, he moved his stony members. He saw England. Ah, shall the dead live again? The breath divine went forth over the morning hills. Albion rose in anger, the wrath of God breaking bright on all sides around his awful limbs. Into the heavens he walked clothed in flames. So that's Albion awakening through the divine breath through Jerusalem. And then in a second part of this great resurrection scene, Jesus lost and then Albion himself are identified with Jesus, this incarnational notion. And this is how Blake describes it. Then Jesus appeared standing by Albion as the good shepherd, by the lost sheep that he had found. And Albion knew that it was the Lord the universal humanity, and Albion saw his form, a man, and they conversed as man with man in ages of eternity, and the divine appearance was the likeness and similitude of loss. So this is all to say that there's a mystical Christianity deeply informing Blake's Christianity, and especially, I think, this notion of deification focused on the identification with the figure of Jesus, who is this timeless through the imagination, and by timeless I mean constant and continual in time, recognition of the human form divine. But if you're persuaded that's Blake's understanding of Christianity, there's a good question to ask, which is, so how does this come about? And Blake explains, I think, also, he unpacks the stance that brings about this deification. And two features are particularly important the continual forgiveness of sins, which I've already alluded to, and also a notion of self-annihilation, as Blake calls it, which particularly becomes important in the latter part of his work. Here's one of Blake's images of Jesus's resurrection appearance. So think first of all about forgiveness. And what forgiveness is about, I think, is not the need to remove sin, as Protestant substitution theory suggests, that Jesus had to die in order to take our punishment. 
but in order rather that moment by moment we might be free to respond to the divine presence that's all around us. Forgiveness, if you like, has already happened. What needs to happen subsequently is for us acceptance of that forgiveness that then liberates us, frees us to be in the divine presence moment by moment, this continual act of incarnation. And Blake summarizes this in a section from the Everlasting Gospel, um, this long poem he was working on, never published, but contained some real gems in terms of his understanding of things. So let me read a section from that. It goes like this. What can this gospel of Jesus be? What life and immortality? What was it that he brought to light that Plato and Cicero did not write? The heathen deities wrote them all, these moral virtues, great and small. What is the accusation of sin but moral virtues? Um, deadly gin. The moral virtues in their pride did o'er the world's triumphant ride in wars and sacrifice for sin and souls to hell ran trooping in. The accuser, holy God of all, this pharisaic worldly ball amidst them in his glory beams upon the rivers and the streams. So that's in a way a condemnation of the old notion of Christianity and how it really condemns people to hell. But then Blake continues and says, then Jesus rose and said to me, thy sins are all forgiven thee. Loud Pilate howled like Caiaphas yelled when they the gospel light beheld. Jerusalem, he said to me, it was when Jesus said to me, thy sins are all forgiven thee. The Christian trumpets loud proclaim through all the world in Jesus name, mutual forgiveness of each vice and opened the gates of paradise. The moral virtues in great fear forms the cross and nail and spear. And the accuser standing by cried out, crucify, crucify. The crucifixion is because of this world not being able to accept forgiveness. It's not the means of forgiveness. Blake completely inverting things there in order to emphasize this mystical continual possibility of a stepping into eternity. You see this in one of the best known images of Christ crucified by Blake in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. And, and notice here um, that it's as much a transfiguration as it is a crucifixion with the light and maybe the fruit on the trees too. And of course, the figure before, maybe Loss, maybe Albion, imitating Christ, beginning to know in themselves of this light, of this true nature of our embodied existence. Um, and this gives me the chance to, to think about self-annihilation as well, because I think it's not about a kind of overcoming of the ego as we might think of it now. I mean, you know, the ego, wasn't even really invented 200 years ago and um, it's not really till Freud um, that we started talking about egos in this way. I think it's something slightly different. It's really the continual overcoming of the sense that we're separate, that somehow we're not intimate with the divine, that when we hear phrases like I am in you, you're in me, mutual in love divine, we think skeptically, how can that possibly be? And um, the overcoming of that sense of separation, therefore, is the self-annihilation and all that that involves. I mean, Blake goes into what that separation amounts to throughout his work, particularly in the figure of lost Eurozen, um, when Eurozen figures that he can step out on his own, um, losing touch with the other Zoas um, and descending into these fallen states that Blake so vividly describes. Um, we perhaps know it more personally with these dialogues with our spectre, um, the reasoning mentality that tries to persuade us we can work it out, we are self-sufficient, um, but our pride is what we need and we should distrust anything that might be related to or connected with beyond ourselves. Um, and Blake in Jerusalem has Jesus um, addressing that concern, but through the notion of self-annihilation which is the stepping out of that separate self into a wider possibility, which Jesus puts like this when he speaks to Albion. Jesus replied, fear not Albion, unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall rise again and thou with me. This is friendship and brotherhood. Without it, man is not. So Jesus spoke. The covering cherub coming on in darkness overshadowed them. And Jesus said, 
Thus do men in eternity, one for another, to put off by forgiveness every sin. Albion replied, cannot man exist without mysterious offering of self for another? Is this friendship and brotherhood? I see thee in the likeness and similitude of loss, my friend. Jesus said, wouldest thou love one who never died for thee, or ever die for one who had not died for thee? And if God dieth not for man and giveth not himself eternally for man, man could not exist. For man is love as God is love. So self-annihilation, this stepping back into love, which is can feel like a kind of death when you've been trusting the spectre, when the spirit of Urizen has seized the whole culture, and yet actually it's a stepping into more. And I think Blake actually found a lot of his inspiration for this understanding of Christianity, not perhaps just through his connections with the Orthodox and so on, and but also in his reading of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, this was translated into English in the 1780s, and Blake was one of the first readers. Um, he painted a portrait of Charles Wilkins, um, the translator here you can see um, he also drew images of the brahmins and i think in many ways you can spot how details in blake's work show that he knew the gita the name vala being one of them a sort of play on the notion of maya or ignorance and veiling but also in his understanding of christianity because in the gita it's very clear that there's a kind of understanding of self-annihilation that would appeal to Blake, which is to throw all that you have into what you're doing, but without worrying about the consequences. It's giving what you have to the moment, but letting that moment then become part of a much wider unfolding. And that is what stepping into eternity is about. His, what, his vision is one that can embrace without the need to exclude other traditions as well, you might note. This is a kind of understanding of Christianity that's deeply commodious and understands that the human imagination, the divine vision is operative throughout the world. How could it be otherwise if you believe in a monotheistic God? And so finding inspiration in the Bhagavad Gita, I think came quite naturally to Blake. And it'd be lovely to know what his annotations were on his copy given that he had one we don't know that and yet I think you can see these traces and this spirit coming back into his account of Christianity so look so something, something about forgiveness and something about self-annihilation um, but let me just ask again you know why are these elements so crucial what's going on here here you can see a plate from Milton another one of the uh, longer poems from the second half of Blake's life. Um, there's this figure approaching Eurizen with his tablets of stone and Blake's even drawn it so that the foot cuts through selfhood quite deliberately in the design. And then you can see the delight in eternity with uh, the, the figures there, the celestial beings playing their musical instruments. As you'll know from the illustrations to Job, it's very important in Blake that musical instruments are being played, not just hanging on trees. And the point is that this selfhood and its denial lets in eternity into the present moment. In a generation, just the cyclical repeat sense of life, which we otherwise have in generation, can become regeneration. It can become this sort of chirotic cut through chronological time. And so that every moment can become known as something new. Beulah, not just being a rest place from the tension of contraries like life and death, can become actually a, a portal or a gateway, a threshold into eternity. As Blake describes it, Beulah is wrapped around eternity. And this then is another way of talking about how the incarnation is continuous. As Blake puts it in Milton in this wonderful, wonderful summary of things, he says, there is a moment in each day that Satan cannot find. And just in, as a side, Satan here is the name for the state that is opaque, that is limited, that doesn't understand the pregnancy of every moment. So there's a moment in every day, in each day, that Satan cannot find, nor can his watch fiends find it, but the industrious find it, this moment, and it multiply. And when it is once found, it renovates every moment of the day, if rightly placed. This invitation to understand what's going on here. And it's not just the human form divine, that might be become regenerated and multiplied um, and 
renovated if this moment is rightly placed when the industrious find it. The whole of nature will too. Um, Milton is full of delightful accounts of what it's like to see the natural world, the creatures, even the bugs and the flies and so on from the perspective of eternity. And in this final image, which shows Olalon in this cruciform figure, she too is identified with Jesus in Milton, but also these plants, which have now taken on the human form as divine as well. They, they know of their intelligence and so become part of this incarnational moment as well. This is something which Blake understood because for him, the word men or man, or of course woman as well, doesn't refer primarily to the genders, although it can, it, it's, it's drawn from the same root as mind or mentality. And so it's knowing of the divine logos, the divine intelligence, the divine creativity in all things. And hence he can talk about um, stars and comets and mountains and streams and rivers and plants and so on, all appearing as men. It's code for saying that intelligence awakens them to this incarnation as well. So look, why should we be bothered by this today? If you buy this vision and think it is tremendous, then why is it still relevant? If you're wary of Blake's Christianity, thinking it was something that belonged to the Georgian period, but really can't belong to us now because of all that's happened in between times, Blake addresses that question too. And I wanted to take you back to this early publication, There Is No Natural Religion, to begin to tease at least some of that now. Essentially, Blake has a critique of the naturalism, as we now call it, which is the doctrine that the natural sciences are the best and really preeminent ways of understanding the truth of things, physics, chemistry and biology and so on. And of course, they would say that we live in a closed cosmos that is, even with the subtleties of quantum theory, is nonetheless mechanical is inert, is not alert, is not intelligently responding. Blake, I think, saw this coming and had some very powerful and punchy arguments as to why this just couldn't be so. There is no imagination in a closed system universe, of course, of course, of course um, it just imagines that we're kind of lighthouse minds beaming out meaning, beaming out beauty, beaming out intelligence, um, but really it's just a sort of failed effort to awaken things. But Blake, he makes this sort of epistemological point and says that if the senses, the empirical senses were all that we had, that wouldn't be enough to understand things, to resonate with the cosmos, to receive the intelligence that our intelligence can then pick up, because facts alone are not enough, they don't bring insight. There's always the need for this wider understanding and knowing with which we can become attuned. And Blake unpacks it in this plate four from There Is No Natural Religion. when he says the bounded is loathed by its possessor. The same dull round, even of a universe, would soon become a mill with complicated wheels. Of course, that notion of the cosmos as a bit like a meal with com a meal with complicated wheels is the popular sense of things, at least. And it becomes, Blake argues, as just a dull round, dead, deadening, leading to despair, to alienation, to isolation. And then, of course, back to selfhood and spectre and to Eurozenic ways of life. And so deepening the fall. The bounded cosmos is loathed by its possessor. We become, we turn out rejecting what we otherwise try to enlighten with our kind of lighthouse minds. But there's also an anthropological point, um, and this becomes a kind of critique of consumption. And remember, mercantilism is getting going in Blake's day. Figures like Adam Smith noticed how it was a once weighing people down, but was sort of a necessary trick in order to kickstart progress. But Blake is deeply suspect of that, not because he shouldn't, we shouldn't want more and more, but because we must want it in the right way. And he explains this in the fifth plate with, I think, a very, very brilliant couple of lines summary of things. When Blake says, if the many become the same as the few when possessed, more and more is the cry of a mistaken soul, less than all cannot satisfy man. So what he's saying here is, if the many, and I think that means the sort of many trinkets, the many things that a mercantile culture increasingly offers us to buy, 
If the many become the same as the few when possessed, so the idea is that we can only have a few of these many things on offer, but we kind of get caught in this consumptive headmill, constantly buying a few more of the many, as if that's the kind of goal of life. Blake says, no, more, more, the kind of cry of the consumptive life is actually the cry of a mistaken soul. But what then he, he then adds is that to say, OK, we should consume less, we should sort of limit the econ economy, have zero growth, try and factor in um, ways of living like that. Blake says, no, he feels that's a terrible mistake as well, because the truth is that with this meeting of the divine and the human within us, we do have infinite desire. The question is, are we trying to satisfy it by more and more, or, as he concludes in the plate, less than all cannot satisfy man. We must relearn this mystical Christianity, Blake is saying, and so know of through our imaginations of the incarnation within us that we in our finitude can know of infinitude and our transient and temporal state can know of eternity. These things as it were sit one within the other. So you might summarize by that by saying that humanity without transcendence, without an imminent experience sense of that notion, without the imagination not just as something that comes out of us but rather that floods into us with which we can then respond we become spectrous we become eurozenic and it's you know many of the problems which we did today which is why this vision of blake's is not just one for 200 years ago but is so pressing now i think and this is what happens when we forget this imminent divinity within us here's the famous image of loss conversing with the spectre at the beginning of Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, um, the spectre trying to persuade Loss that together they can work it out. But what it really leads to is this, which Blake describes at the beginning of the great poem when he says, but the perturbed man away turns down the valley's dark, saying, we are not one, we are many, thou most simulative phantom of the overheated brain, shadow of immortality seeking to keep my soul a victim to thy love, which binds man, the enemy of man, into deceitful friendships. Jerusalem is not. Her daughters are indefinite. By demonstration, man alone can live, and not by faith. My mountains are my own, and I will keep them to myself. The Malvern and the Cheviot, the walls, Philhinnon and Snowdon are mine. Here will I build my laws of moral virtue. Humanity shall be no more but war and princedom. And victory. Blake routinely came to stress the wastes of moral law, this kind of substitute for a living, vital experience of the divine, turning it into a kind of code, which is what deism did and which cultural Christianity now broadly does. And for Blake, that means that humanity shall be no more, removing this lived experience of the divine and Jesus, the imagination, is anti humanistic. It's not humanism as we often refer to it now it's precisely the opposite and what it leads to is war princedom and the quest for victory possessiveness um, by demonstration alone shall man live and, and this extraordinarily um, prescient um, remark um, phantom of an overheated brain and of course now when you read about religion you're barely two pages away from some kind of neuro scan saying precisely that there's other reasons why um, this divine experience is needed and it's not just for our own humanity but I think is for our relationship with the natural world I touched on it when you saw that earlier image from the end of Milton with Olilon identified with Jesus and then also the plant world itself identified with the divine intelligence and this is about understanding our relationship to the natural world not just by stewardship or guardianship which is the sort of trend now, you might say, because the problem with this is that this is a kind of moral understanding of the crisis and instantiation of virtues, which just actually leads to guilt. And um, because we constantly fail if moral standards are what we're judging ourselves by. And then, of course, blame kicks in all sorts of squabbles and so on. It divides humanity, the waste of the moral law. Now, what Blake's saying is that we need a participative a communing with the natural world, an understanding that we have a shared ontology. And that being, that ontology is shared in this triangular way. Our intelligence, 
The different intelligences of the many around us are one because there is many manifestations of the divine intelligence. There are many reflections and echoes of the divine life that is within us and all things, this transcendence that's imminent. That is what we need to understand, Blakewood said. And without that comes split, comes division, comes burdensome insistences on moral demands and so on, the kind of guilt that becomes eurozenic and takes us away from the divine. We need a shared identification with God. Without a loss of, di of, of diversity, though, without a loss of difference, um, as, as Coleridge put it, there can be, um, this there can be um, distinction without difference. So we can know of the many things when we realise that they're all as many variant sharings in the one thing. That's another reason why this triangulation is so necessary. Blake celebrates it in the famous poem which he wrote to Thomas Butts when they moved for that short period down to Feltham. Um, I'll, I'll read it out now. I just note, um, again, you know, when he talks about men, he's talking about this mentality, this intelligence, this divine life that's in all things. And Blake writes, my first vision of light on the yellow sand sitting, the sun was emitting his glorious beams from heaven's high streams over sea, over land. My eyes did expand into regions of air away from all care, into regions of fire, remote from desire. The light of the morning, heaven's mountains adorning in particles bright, the jewels of light distinct shone and clear. Amazed and in fear, I each particle gazed, astonished, amazed, for each was a man, human formed, swift I ran, for they beckoned to me, remote by the sea, saying, each grain of sand, every stone on the land, each rock and each hill, each fountain and rill, each herb and each tree, mountain, hill, earth and sea, cloud, meteor and star, are men seen afar. I stood in the beams of heaven's bright beams. So that reference there to man is also a reference to this incarnational understanding of Christianity, expanded now, so that standing in the streams of heaven's bright beams, I should have said, becomes a possibility through this triangulation. Just to touch on a couple of other reasons why this might matter, and I'll begin to draw to a close, and I hope this is prompting lots of questions and thoughts. Um, I think sentiment won't be enough either. Um, Blake particularly ex explores what now we think of as empathy, altruism, solidarity. These words weren't actually invented in Blake's time. They come in the 19th century and then the 20th century when deism becomes atheism. And there's a sense of needing to revive human sentiment in order to try and achieve what a sense of oneness in the divine life might have brought to us before. Um, but I think Blake saw through this coming notion of empathy and so on, because he recognised that it divides quite as much as it unites. What, what was going on there was the beginnings of what's now called the hallucination theory of consciousness. So this is the idea that our brain, our bodies generate perceptions of the world, having received the imprints from the empirical senses, and then project out that awareness, that perception onto the world around us, hence the notion of hallucination. And if we're lucky, sometimes those hallucinations do actually um, meet, as it were, reality, and then we have a sense of connection. But Blake was right onto this and said, this kind of pity, as he puts it, divides the human soul as much as it unites it, because we're only really always stuck with our own sense of things and a faint sort of promise of communion when our own sense of things happily coincides, but in the next moment it won't coincide. And so we're left with this kind of tussle of union and then division if we're to rely on what became notions like altruism and empathy and solidarity. I put two here images from the first book of Eurozone, and which I think contrast on the one hand, what Blake feared would be coming through reliance on sentiment and sympathy instead of the sacred and the divine vision. And this, this image of Eurozone locked in himself, in his mind, and so therefore chained to the ground. And But there's this, there's not many moments of hope in the first book of Eurozone, but there is right at the beginning with this lovely image, probably of the soul being guided through life, which is this gold, lovely brilliance, certainly in this reproduction, um, being guided by a kind of celestial vision, uh, a, a, an image of communion and unity rather than separation and enchainment. 
these these theories um, are, are really worth thinking through that we have now. Um, and I think that Blake has a lot to say to them. That's another reason why we need this Christian vision now, I think. Penultimate point. Um, I think that we also need this because of what happened in the meantime. I think that in the 19th century, part of what happened that separated Blake's understanding of Christianity from our own times was that as um, Feuerbach um, put it in his famous book about the Christian religion, translated into English by George Eliot, um, that all theology is actually anthropology. All theology is actually anthropology. And so Feuerbach spells out the modern sort of assumption, the sceptical critique, atheist critique of belief in God. That actually, it's just a projection from our inner lives onto the cosmos. And so anything we might say about God is really just a reflection on our own humanity, lost, cut off, not part of transcendent life. Of course, Fogart didn't put it that like that. He thought that this was progress. And um, But Blake is saying, as it were, ahead of time, no, all anthropology is actually theology that we when we reflect on our humanity we discover the divine life and that is how we can know within ourselves in our finitude that there's an infinite abyss within us that's how we can know in our temporal lives that every moment is cut through by eternity and I think this, un this explains why um, Blake in the everlasting gospel um, has what can seem like a rather paradoxical line and um, when he says um, God is no more thy own humanity learn to adore sometimes cited as if Blake actually is anticipating a kind of atheistic humanism I think actually what's going on there is this is God in God's self saying to Jesus as Jesus is about to enter historical time in the incarnation um, what your task is now is to forget as it were God the father and know of God the son within your humanity and so this is the incarnation again, that God becoming as we are so that we may be as he is. It's actually quite a common sentiment amongst the mystics that the God that's afar off, the God that is deemed to be transcendent, the God that is not intimately involved in our lives, that God must die. God is no more. And thy own humanity therefore learn to adore because that awakens the fullest sense of the divine life in the divine vision that's also the human imagination so to come to a close you know the apocalyptic in blake too um, is remade along these lines as he puts it the apocalyptic is the truth realized moment by moment through the forgiveness of sins through self-annihilation through living at this point in which eternity cuts through time at which generation becomes regeneration the contrary is of the finite and the infinite don't take us from eternity, but actually are precisely the stepping stone into eternity. As Blake puts it, the apocalypse is when any individual rejects error and embraces truth, a last judgment passes upon that individual. And just to draw to a close with this lovely image again, I think at Thomas Butts's commission of the end of Mark's gospel, which shows the three Marys approaching the tomb and the angel saying, he's not risen, he's not here, he has arisen. And the three Marys, as the gospel in its original form, end afraid. I think Blake would have loved this because this is precisely the moment of possibility, the moment when it's possible to step into eternal vision, the moment that I think according to Blake's Christianity is every moment for us. And he, in his poetry and in his understanding, this deep perception, I think, of the mystical forms of Christianity, making him, to my mind, one of the most important post-Reformation mystics in the Western world. That is what he offered his times, and I think still offers for us now, needed even more so, I think you might well say. So, Sabelia, I'll end there, and I hope we can have a rich discussion. Thank you. Um, sorry, there was there was so much in your talk, so rich, and um, every moment opened up into so many avenues. And it's, I think it's a reminder for us all. I mean, I can speak for myself, of course, that the words that we use, eternity, imagination, transfiguration, once we talk to someone who has a theological background, 
they, they turn and, and they, they um, shine in, in all of their dimensions. And I've just seen a, sorry, that's a thing I think Ian put in. Um, so while people are still thinking, first this is um, questions and answers and more thinking. So thank you so much for giving us so much to think about. Um, and so if you in the audience want to ask Mark a question, you can raise your hand by using the reactions tab and then we will see you. Um, and while people are getting ready, I'm, I, did you did you call Blake a mystic, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I I realised um, as I was saying it, this is a controversial way of describing. But <laughs> ever since Northrop Northrop Fry said he's not a mystic, he's a visionary, and I think you know it make, makes a really important point that Blake wants us to perceive this. He doesn't want us just to disappear into a kind of vague hand wavy sense that okay, there's more to life. Um, no, he wants us to know it directly, to participate in these things, and hence being a visionary, really, rather than a mystic. Of course, it, it relates to his own clairvoyance, which he knew throughout his life as well, which no doubt you know, set him off clearly on this path and enabled him to develop this rich theology and account of what it is to be human. So, yes, mm -hmm. thank you for picking me up on that. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I um, having worked on the European reception of Blake, there were many moments when European academics, colleagues, thinkers, philosophers, writers, um, it, at different points in time or writing, perceived or approached Blake through a mystical lens. They would argue that he didn't have the same system, but it was that quality in Blake that attracted him. And it was exactly the North of Fry um, declaration that, that comes into mind. And so I think it's on balance. I think, why can't we have both? Certainly. Very welcome. Um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question in the audience? Can I just stress, I hope there are, but and please feel free to ask the simple questions if that if that's what feels comes to the fore, because they're often the best. You know, Blake's all about getting to the heart of things. Um, and but just to say, um, I, I see that um Tristan Connolly made a note in the comments that this book that I referred to that I didn't know the title of, but it's called Blake Sees Jesus, um, edited by her and Helen Bruder. Mm -hmm. Um, and Suzanne's contribution is in that. Um, so do look out for that. I hope it's coming out soon. Now, I believe it was delayed because of COVID. Uh, yes, it was delayed by a lot of things. I'm sorry to just jump in, but I couldn't find the put up my hand button. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Can you show yourself, Trista? Let me see if I can figure that out. Um, my camera. Something's happening. Ah, hello. <laughs> um. Yes, um, it uh, was delayed by COVID and, and several things, but we are getting in gear uh, eventually with uh, the Blake Sees Jesus book. Um, thank you very much for, for the mention. And uh, as I mentioned in the comment, um, uh, Suzanne's contribution is just wonderful, um, not only for that um, connection to the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, you know, theologically, but also in, in Blake's actual potential life experience, um, and also for her discussion of, of resurrection, uh, and that image from Jerusalem of the imitation uh, of uh, by, by the witness of the crucifixion. Um, I, I had a question, actually, too, um, which is an obvious one, considering your kind mention of uh, our collection. Um, yeah, the title is Blake Sees Jesus, uh, because it is uh, concentrating on Jesus in Blake's visual art. Um, so vision <laughs> uh, is really important to um, the whole concept for everyone. Um, and uh, you touched on a couple of times the importance of, of vision for Blake in these matters. And um, you and uh, Sibylla were just talking about um, visionary versus mystic. Um, personally, I think that's, uh, you know, splitting hairs. <laughs> and a, a bit of a, a bit of a problem too. like, why ins insist that all mystics have to be the same as each other or else they're not mystics? It's a it seems inimical to mysticism itself. Um, but anyway, my my question was, would you like to say a little bit more uh, about your view um, of the importance of uh, vision uh, for uh, Blake and his uh, relation to depiction of uh, Jesus, especially in relation to um, the way you also emphasized um, empiricism? 
Um, and, uh, you know, if one thinks about just how important vision is, you know, seeing things, <laughs> uh, how, how important that is to, uh, to empiricism. Um, so any thoughts about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think that empiricism itself is a kind of triumph of the imagination um, for as much as um, what it excludes in order to intensify. Um, you know, empirical methods have, have led to great things. And of course, Blake's not against science. He's only worried about it when it becomes cut off from the imagination and from a wider perception of things. And um, so, you know, imagination's always involved. It's just a question of how it's involved. Um, and hence, Blake can make these comments about, you know, um, what to one man, the tree is something in the way, whereas to others, you know, somewhere else is a tree or, you know, that the money purse to one person is more glorious than the rising sun and so on. We, we're always taking a whole set of presumptions and um, imaginative uh, um, capabilities to our sight. And so I think, you know, Blake was one of these visionaries who would say, it's not like he saw more. He, he didn't see things that you or I can't see, but he just saw them more fully. Um, and hence it take, takes him into eternity. Um, you know, when it comes to his um, depictions of Jesus, um, I think that, you know, he, his understanding of the Bible is very visionary as well. He makes this famous remark to the Reverend Trussler, I think it is, um, about how the Bible, you shouldn't read it as a kind of factual account of things, as if it's a historical document that if you're lucky, you can get together enough empirical evidence to make the Christian story stand up. You know, that you're on a hiding to constant frustration and being buffeted by every skeptical win there he says no no that the bible is a springboard the reason why we're still reading it 2000 years on is precisely because it opens up the imagination and encourages us to um step out of the narrow coin confines of say euro vehicles you know single vision and so on and be able to appreciate to see um you know the divine vision the human form divine see as it were the presence of jesus in all things um, and hence you know particularly when he does these images of biblical stories for thomas butts there's always a little bit of a twist um which for blake is not him as it were forcing the bible into his own account of things it's precisely using the bible in the right way running with the spirit of things to reopen what the original gospel writers were trying to capture as well, this lived present sense of possibility, not just a kind of historical document and account. Mm. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you, Tristan, for your question. And I can see that Katie, Katie Carr has raised her hand. Can you yeah, ask your question? Yeah, firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much for the most um, enlightening um, discussion and presentation. That was amazing, Mark. Um, I, I would like to come back to the comment and uh, quote that you, you gave that the, um, there is a moment in each day that Satan cannot find. Um, I'm curious to ask you, since Blake was such a devout Christian, why do you think um, so many people from the darker, um, darker faiths, you know, have misinterpreted his work? Um, that 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 seems to be confusing to me and I'm sorry it's such a basic question but I just wanted to ask you why you think these darker energies um revolve around his work if that makes any sense yeah no thank you um I mean Blake kind of tells us um it's because um we we live we now live in a time that's sort of fully manifested but that he saw coming um, when by demonstration alone shall you live and not by faith um, that um, immortality is a shadow um, that by um, anything that we could call the imagination is really just a phantasm of an overheated brain um, he saw the scientific um, explanations for things coming I think you can you can't really overemphasize the presence of John Locke um, in Blake's centuries um, and um, you know, that's there's a reason why Blake, uh, New Baker, Newton, and Locke are um, are Blake's triumphant, as you say, of sort of bad energies. Um, I think he's a bit unfair on Bacon. He's almost certainly rather unfair on Newton, the man, but probably not on John Locke. Actually, um, I think he probably got John Locke about right because of Locke's sense that you know we're born as tabula rasas, 
um, these kind of monads, if you like, that then receive sense impressions. We have a bit of imagination, according to Locke, but it's just to sort of jiggle things around inside us to make some kind of coherent sense of, of, of things. But it's not, it's not because of some kind of resonance or harmony with the wider divine life from whence we came, nothing like that in John Locke. Um, and similarly, the sort of stress, therefore, on God becoming a kind of moral lawgiver. And so the wastes of moral law um, that, you know, might seem a good idea. Cultural Christianity, according to some, is reviving now because Western civilization needs this moral underpinning. And materialism won't do it. And we're sort of hemmed in on every side, um, according to some. Um, cultural Christianity in that form will be equally disastrous, Blake would tell us, because it just leads to more division. It's not rooted in this sense of participation. Um, yeah, so I think that that same spirit, of course, then infects the way that people read Blake. Um, and, um, you know, if, when Blake's read in the universities, for example, um, outside of theology departments, with the best will in the world, it's very hard to talk about the spirit and matters religious, let alone mystical and visionary. Um, you know, the, the constant pressure is to force that approach through the sieve of, I don't know, sociology or some kind of reading about power or whatever. The, the point, I, I don't want to just do those down though, because they have insights, you know, that's brought a lot to the reading of Blake as well, but it seems to be often at the cost of what you're emphasizing and which I agree with you on that, um, sort of sadly, the loss of the heart of it. Yes, thank you so much. I, I, I was just, um, I'm always confused as to why some, for instance, some artists or, 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 you know, will use Blake and cite Blake, but their, their creations have very little to do with the core and the purity of Blake's vision and his devout, devout connection to Christ. Thank you so much. I mean, perhaps I should just also add that, you know, Christianity is a complicated thing. I've already sort of tried to identify which strand Blake, I think, um, himself would have identified with. And there's much that Christendom, particularly, you know, Blake also lived through the period of expanding empire and so on. Christianity was deeply involved in that. I mean, when he read the Bhagavad Gita, that was one of the more sort of lighter moments in the history of the East India Company. Um, but soon after the period that the Gita was translated, of course, um, Christian evangelicals went to India, demonized um, Hindus, um, and that led to atrocities and famines and so on. Um, so, um, you know, there's good reason why we're skeptical of Christianity as well. Um, but Blake has a kind of critique of that. Um, religion hid in war um, is his summary, too. So we can need to take note of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And um, I can see you, John, but there's two more questions in the chat. So I go to the questions in the chat first, if I may. So there is a question by Joanne Newbury. Joanne, you're welcome to come and ask your question. I can read it. The question is the final plate, he is risen moment, teases with Eurism. Any comments on all right, Joanne, you'll, you'll have to appear, I'm afraid, like a vision before us, um, just to say a little bit more so I can get a sense of, of what you're wondering about there or, or, or what you what you see in that plate, of course. Oh, she, she says she can't do that. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure how to respond then. Um, I mean, you know, maybe just to make a, an oblique comment that might be of use that of course, at the end of Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, um, uh, Bacon, Newton and Locke appear hand in hand with Milton, Shakespeare and Chaucer. Um, there's, a, there's a happy reunion in eternity of the scientific and the artistic, as we would now put it. Um, and of course, Eurozen has a place amongst the four Zoas when in right relationship with the others as well. Um, Blake's not anti-reason, as I hope I've showed, actually. You know, he's actually a deeply perceptive philosopher, quite able to take on figures like John Locke. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the next question, sorry, there's something happening in my chat. The next question is by Ben Kramer. And again, Ben, if you can come and show yourself, and, but I'll read your question as you make up your mind. Um, could you say something about Blake's relationship to radical theology oh there ben is 
Yeah, thank you, Mark. Just to thank you and ask whether you could say something about Blake's relationship to radical theology. This kind of question is, is it one of those where you actually know quite a lot about this and perhaps you could illuminate us or? No, it's not. I, could, I, I couldn't really um, elaborate on the question at all, really. I'm sort of beginning to get a grasp of what, that there might be a distinction between mystical and radical theology. So I was interested to hear you sort of yeah. speak to that. Yes. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you know, other people might have a, as good a sense of this as me. I mean, you know, radical refers to returning to the radix, you know, the, the roots. Um, I think that um, Blake's um, mystical Christianity is returning to a, a core strand that goes all the way back over 2000 years, you know, hence referencing these church fathers and so on at the beginning. Um, now, there is um, a growing interest in Eastern traditions, Orthodox traditions. I mean, Rome Williams, um, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, his newest book, The Passions of the Soul, is essentially based on a figure called Evagrius Ponticus, um, which is a kind of radical Christian mysticism psychology. Um, so there is, I think, um, a resonance with um, what Blake was saying and what maybe is coming to the fore now. Um, I've no doubt that Blake's inspired directly various forms of radical theology as well. Um, but in relation to what I was saying to, tonight, I mean, you know, he, he certainly is a radical. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you, Ben. And uh, Mark, I just spotted in the... Um in the chat so there's some response from the literary minded people so um it could be a part pun a counter pun so a reason your reason and isn't she asking if it's a play on words so that's thank you to gareth and ellen james thank you for that you know that there's a lot said about the word your reason your reason um horizon limiting horizons and so on but i've not actually heard the link made to arisen so that's thank you that's a new one to me that, and i like that so thank you to all three of you. Um, John, John Jobson. Uh, thank you very much, for, uh, Mark, for that talk. Um, however, my problem is this. Uh, I've been reading Blake and looking uh, at his pictures for perhaps 60 years now, and I know a fair amount at a superficial level um, let us say, you know, first year undergraduate level of understanding of Blake. Listening to your talk, I found this is too hard for me to understand because I don't have enough background in the kind of level of knowledge that you obviously have. What I want to know is how can I get from my sort of, as you say, first year undergraduate level of understanding of Blake to your you know, all, almost, you know, postgraduate level understanding. I found your talk hard to understand because it was using language in a way that I wasn't used to. Is it, Can you help me with that? Yeah, look, I appreciate it. And um, Blake's one of these very paradoxical figures that in a way, he, he was a fox, you know, not a hedgehog in Isaiah Berlin's famous distinction. He really had one big idea. Or is it the hedgehog that has the one big idea and not the It must be the hedgehog that has the one big idea. Anyway, you take the point. Um, but he unpacks it and unfolds it um, in you know multiple ways. Um, and um, because I think of his, his extraordinary eternal imagination, he can see the divine presence of spirit everywhere. And of course, when it's fallen as well. So I'm, I'm you know, Sibeli introduced me as living in Camberwell, the lovely hills of Camberwell. Um, was how Blake described this part of South London where I live. So um, that can be immensely confusing when it sort of first, first hits you, um, I mean, even maybe 60 years on. Um, but um, I think, you know, the core idea in Blake is summarised in There's No Natural Religion, very simply put in that short pamphlet with its climax, um, therefore God becomes as we are so that we might be as he is. And if you hold those kind of lights in your hand when you're reading Blake and then wonder how what he's presenting to you in an image, in a, in a line, in a, um, you know, a, a poem, how that is a facet of these very central ideas, um, then you can never go too far wrong. Um, I mean, he, he, he knew that um, the fallen state, the Eurozenic state, um, the state of generation and so on, um, all row, um, they deeply lead people astray and produce many terrible ills and evils, which he knew in his time, we know in ours. Um, but 
Blake is one of these figures for whom they're all misguided steps, um, forms of ignorance, you know, Vala who veils, Maya, to reference the Gita again. Um, and so strangely, the truth and falsehood are, are often much, much closer together than we might imagine. Um, these slight twists lead us immensely astray. Um, but this is every moment, you know, that Satan cannot find um, is a moment to return to really quite central and fundamental things that we human beings do have infinite desire. Consumption has kind of capitalized upon that, pun intended. Um, but if we can re-educate ourselves um, through this new perception and recognize the divine humanity within us that is, um, you know, the, the universal father, as, as Blake also puts it, um, you know, that that's his kind of constant theme, really. Um, How do and, I help myself yeah. with re-education? Re Say that again. How do I help myself with that re-education? Maybe it's about not just learning about Blake, but learning from Blake. You know, this is the famous distinction that Kath uh, Kathleen Rain made, um, that um, the wrestling we do is partly about learning, you know, who these figures were, the twists and turns, something about Blake's time, something about his own education and so on. Um, but really the deeper side of it is learning from Blake, um, letting the poetry and the imagery catalyze something in us, even if it's a yearning, a longing, that's absolutely fundamental. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's something of that and, 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 a, and a bit like this, you know, there's a moment, there's a moment in every day um, Ultimately, Blake doesn't want you just to enjoy his poetry. He wants you to know what the living presence of his poetry is like in your life every moment. Um, you know, self-annihilation is not just a, the idea of a mystic. It's actually a way of life. Um, and it's not one that one can enter into immediately, um, but can become a kind of pattern and a habit over time. I think Blake himself worked at this throughout his life. I don't know if that's any use, John. It, but... it, it gives me a, a starting point anyway. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. And I'm um, looking at the um, chat. Kristen's recommending Jason's book, Divine Images. And there is certainly a point, and it's a very important starting point, to start with learning about his life. And as Mark said, it's that's one thing. And the other thing is to learn from him. And I agree, having taught Blake in poetry classes, it always becomes very difficult when students ask, what is the soul? This is another book which I found immensely helpful, actually, um, Eternity's Sunrise by Leo Damrosch. Um, I, I found this a very helpful book as well. Yeah, thank you for that recommendation. I invite everyone to put these um, recommendations into the chat because um, Everyone has a starting point um, where they start from and where they can move to, and also to emphasize what we are doing here in this conversation or at the Blake Society. It's talking, talking about Blake and with each other, and it's the different angles that open up what Blake can be. And you use the word Blake's understanding of Christianity to really understand this. Um, this is why we're having this conversation and maybe there are more questions than answers we can comprehend at this moment in time. So it's an ongoing process. Um, and Blake, um, yeah, Stephen is also endorsing that the Damrosh book. So th these are all quite recent books. Um, they're older ones as well. Um, any more questions from the audience? Anything that stood out or you found interesting want to talk more about or know more about Stephen Stephen please Mark I thought that was that was an absolutely brilliant talk that was so um, clear and uh, you deliver it so so well and read read the Blake so well just I've been asked recently about the uh, the feminine the female in Blake um, and one book that struck me, uh, the author was mentioned, Suzanne Sklar, her book on Jerusalem. Is it Jerusalem as Visionary Theatre? 
I, so I wondered what your your responses are when 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 if people feel that that Blake's work is very very male at its centre, um, including the figure of of Jesus and and so on. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that Blake works with notions of the masculine and the feminine that um, can rub up the wrong way for us 200 years on. I think you have to admit that. Um, but I think that when you understand, again, the wider context um, that um, he's driving at, um, it makes sense. I mean, one point that actually Suzanne makes very much is um, that Jerusalem is the heroine um, yeah. in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. Um, and so although there's been much critique of figures like Vala um, 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 from feminists and, and uh, um, you know, understandable why, and then phrases that Blake uses like the female will and the shadowy female and so on. Um, I think that what Blake's doing there within this Christian frame is, is um, pointing out the, the fall, as he understands it, which is the fall from divine vision. One of its manifestations is in division, and the division between male and female is one of the fundamental divisions. Um, but in the division, and this is very much part of Blake's Christianity too, is born the yearning to return to unity. And so, you know, the erotic in Blake um, can be both something that's terribly destructive, but also something that is part of the divine path. Um, and I think that when you try and... Um, hold in mind the sometimes it's called the anagogic perspective you know the kind of um the top down view if you like um then um blake's references um to um you know the shadowy female and so on shadowy also it, it, these words get, get get loaded we now rather inclined to read it through jungian eyes as if shadow is something that we've lost touch with or has fallen from view or sort of comes up to haunt us um, but I think it, for Blake, shadow just means that it's a pale reflection of the eternal. In fact, um, you know, the whole world is shadowy. Um, he refers to Catherine, his wife, as, um, you know, my, my shadow stood beside me. Um, and, um, and so it's always worth just checking in how words have changed meaning even 200 years, um, a bit like selfhood. Um, but nonetheless, I think that um, the, the struggles that he describes are part of what um, we experience and yet there's this constant possibility um, of returning to the whole and the notion of the androgynous Blake doesn't use that word but Coleridge did whom he knew and actually a figure that I found very helpful on this is Virginia Woolf um, in a room of one's own towards the end she talks about what she calls the androgynous mind as well picking it up from Coleridge and she describes that in a quite Blakean way which is that the androgynous mind is the mind that has become porous to the whole of humanity after the struggles and the, the fears, the hurts, um, the angers and so on have been kind of worked through. The mind can become porous, she says, and that's for her the ideal creative mind. Um, and Shakespeare is her kind of case in point. The reason why she says we don't know anything about Shakespeare the person is because he had an androgynous mind. He sort of disappears in his work and the whole of life therefore can flow through his work. And um, that's that's quite a Blakean vision of, of, of restoration and regeneration. Mm. There's that sense too in um, in the prophetic poem, Milton, that, um, that Milton is unhappy though in heaven be because he lacks his emanation. There's always a, a sort of um, something to be made complete and Suzanne Sklar, I think, really, really helped me with that. But there's very much a sense of um, Jerusalem as as the Sophia of the Gnostics or the Shekinah of the uh, of the of the uh, of the Jewish mystics. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. That really was so good. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I can see that Barbara Bellacott has her hand up. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, hello. Um, I just wanted to comment on that question about how we re-educate re ourselves in Blake and Vision, and also the distinction you raised, Mark, between learning about Blake and learning from Blake. Um, quite a long time ago now, several years ago, well pre-COVID, um, I had some experiences um, which um, I worked on with Suzanne Sklar of reading Blake aloud in a group and reading uh, Jerusalem and also 
um, with the Blake Society, I, I, we all got, I know this was something I did, organized um, a, a reading of the whole of Milton. And somehow just reading it means that you embody the vision, you become it. And that, that um, it's a vibration in the body that's very incarnational and it's very personal and it's it's shared so that's because i i think how do i you know re-educate myself in blake and catch catch the vision and experience it i have to experience it through reading it aloud that's one way thank you yeah i i do agree i mean i've just been part of a group which has read through milton um and it was invaluable and we had a, a sort of guide who could help hold our hand a bit um, mm -hmm. to start with, which is always useful too. And Suzanne um, conducted a group reading the whole of Jerusalem as well. Yeah. Which was, yeah. was the other thing I found actually is that it's worth, um, if, you can, if you're in London or you can get to London, visiting the places that Blake lived and walked and so on. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that is, but um, to take your, you know, your, your complete Blake, and go to, I don't know, you know, St. James's Piccadilly or go up Primrose Hill or um, even um, Fountains Court, you know, on the Strand. Um, what, you know, there's a plaque there anyway. And, um, and then looking at the Thames and, and um, uh, Tyburn as well, you know, the, the three trees there on the end of Oxford Street. Um, doing that helped me immensely. And I don't really know why, but it was, it's something about connecting actual places to mm. Blake's invocations that's immensely valuable. Mm. There was a Blake Society member who did uh, walking tours of London and stood at, for instance, Tyburn and declaimed some Blake in the spot with a group of us. And that was quite a long time ago, but it was really good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, um, thank Henry you. Um, actually, Stephen has put the name of Henry Elliot. That's um, right. Henry. Henry, Henry, Henry was the person that led us around London, actually, declaiming yeah. bits of Blake, which was great. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's an idea of what to do this summer. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm, I, you know, um, Sibylle mentioned that I'd written this book on Dante, and um, I was in, uh, um, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, where Dante's buried. Um, um, in Italy, uh, gosh, it's a uh, Ravenna, Ravenna, of course, and um, uh, and and particularly since the seven hundredth anniversary of Dante's death, there's little plaques everywhere in Ravenna, and you can scan and then read a bit of Dante and so on. And I, I, I would love to champion something like that here in London, some plaques with a scanner that you could then read some Blake and have it explained and so on. I think it'd be a tremendous project. I think we'll talk more about this because of Blake two hundred and what we can do. There is so much happening in the in the um, chat. So I'm just going to, I've seen you, Jason, right? Um, Jennifer Jessa has written that this is to John. I'm not sure if John's seen it. And I think it's good for all of us to remember. Um, what has always worked for me is just to follow Blake's lead at any given time, looking at a particular image. For example, I find myself drawn to something specific about it. I ask myself why and question myself, and then I find myself in conversation with Blake, and it goes on and on from there. Thank you. And then we have Gareth, and I can see that you replied. So hopefully that's sorted. Gareth, I can see you nodding. And then we have another comment from Joanne. After all, Milton's was born spoken. We have a hand, I see, from Jason Sabino. Yes, Mike yes, yes. I've yeah. seen Jason. I'm just going through. Okay, Jason, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. That was spectacular, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of things. One, I'd like to hear a little more on why you think Blake was unfair on Bacon. That's personally important. Um, and uh, when you were talking about going to the places and being there, I was thinking um, about the participatory 
uh, and the participatory in a in a in the sense that David Bohm might talk about it, like participating in a whole, and how if you can, that might link to what you're saying about Blake and the experience of the divine uh, and the experience of the divine perhaps in a creative sense that Bohm would talk to. Um, I hope that's helpful. I would be interested in what you have to say. I know yeah. it's not too difficult to get at. Can you, can you just repeat the first element as well? It's just slipped my mind. Well, the first thing was simply, uh, I'd like to hear why you think that Blake was unfair on Bacon. Oh, yes. That helps Bacon, me take yeah. my work forward. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's only because a friend of mine's doing a PhD on that period and uh, particularly writing about Francis Bacon's vitalism. Yeah. So, uh, so Bacon didn't think that matter was dead, for example, but thought that it had a kind of um, tendency or character, a kind of vitality. Yeah. Um, and that, that tends to get rather forgotten now. Um, and so um, I think, you know, the, the, there was something that Blake did get right about Bacon, um, particularly the idea that technology will save us, which is yeah. kind of rooted in Francis Bacon's thought, um, and that the human mind needs to be replaced by um, thinking machines and so on. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Clearly, that is uh, fatally um, in error. One would say. Yeah, yeah. And then um, participation that, uh, and participation yeah, yeah. in the whole, in um, the sense. Yeah, I mean, th this word participation, um, which I've used, I get it from Owen Barfield actually. Yeah. Um, and you know, Barfield and Bohm did have a, at least one meeting. Um, yeah, no, it was organized for them. Yeah, so this sense of it, it's capturing um, this understanding that you know, our, our, we're porous, our minds are porous to the wider world, and so we participate in life, we don't just observe it as if from a view from nowhere. And I've no doubt that Bohm has a, an account of that that he developed, particularly you know, in the later part of his life as well. So you know, th these different accounts hopefully can spark um, the actual experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm aware of time, but um, might there be one more question? Because I can see John Dobson raise his hand. John, please. Um, John, ah. I was very interested in what Mark said um, a couple of minutes ago. Um, my problem with Blake um, and understanding Blake is, first of all, I live a long way away from London, 300 miles, and I cannot get to London, uh, and I have mobility problems. So even if I could get to London, I, I couldn't walk around it very much. And the idea of having some sort of view of London from the visual aspect. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's very easy to manage these days. What would it be like to go to Bunhill Fields, for example, on a video where I have never been? What would it be like uh, to look around uh, things like Felpham, for example, where because of my uh, basically houseboundness, um, I have never been and would like to see. Would the Blake Society be interested uh, in producing a YouTube video or equivalent so that I could see all these places that Blake knew about and people in London knew about, um, but I have never seen? Could the Blake Trust help in producing some sort of video of, well, these are the places that Blake was interested in or Blake lived at, and here's, here's a nice video production or equivalent of them to help those of us who are housebound 300 mm -hmm. miles from London. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, John. And I saw in the chat there was also a mention of the cottage and how important the cottage um, in Feltham is as a place. We'll think about this. And um, the next event um, is going to be online. There's going to be a bit more information about this. So we're going to gather at the grave in London. And hopefully, Mark, you will also be able to come. Um, yeah, don't don't go yet. We haven't really thanked you for your talk. I'm 
just inspired for all the suggestions that we can think about and develop and explore as we are approaching the bicentenary of Blake's death and then our next event. Mark, thank you so much for bringing um, Christianity theology back into the discussion or to the discussion. I don't know how to phrase it appropriately. Um, it's so important to just turn these complex ideas and images and histories of thought and then allow them to, to form a constellation with with which we can maybe understand ourselves better in the end, our relationship with the divine inside our very secular um, society and thinking that's torn. And what resonates for me personally is always the time of crises that Blake lived in and that's what we have at the moment. Um, so with all this in mind, thank you so much. So I'm, I'm going to do this and I hope other people do that as well, silently, loudly and in the chat and they have done. Thank you so much for your time in doing this talk for us. And hopefully we see you all um, on the 11th of August at 11 a.m. at Van Hill Fields. And there is a plan, this is to John and anyone who lives far away and cannot travel to London. Um, it's going to be streamed. So we look into this and there's going to be more information in the next newsletter about how this day is going to be. But it's a tradition and we'll be there and it's a face-to-face -face meeting. And I personally, I'm, I just love Zoom that we have this opportunity to connect in that way, wherever we are. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the day wherever you are. And thank you, Mark. Thank you. For, thank you very much. Good night.